Well, welcome everyone. I'm Wendy Blom, the Executive Director of Somerville Community Access Television. We wanted to hold this discussion because change brings uncertainty, and uncertainty brings trepidation. There are big changes occurring in the telecommunications field, including challenges to net neutrality that have many people very worried. It wasn't that long ago that cable TV was very new and brought with it innovation to TV programming that included citizen participation through public access stations nationwide. It also furthered the balkanization of America with niche programming and politically oriented 24-hour news channels that are not required to provide equal time or public service. I don't think anyone would have predicted these outcomes when cable TV was the newest communication medium. From the very beginning, the internet incorporated a public, open access model. And because of that, it radically altered the information and business landscape across the globe. Right now, we're at a crossroads as large corporate interests dominate telecommunication and politics. We're seeing public access through cable TV weakened across the country, although thankfully not in Massachusetts yet. Is that what's in store for the internet as well? What does the future hold for the open internet is the question we'll address to our panel tonight. Many thanks to Erica Jones, SCAP TV Programming and Outreach Coordinator for spearheading this event and pulling it off so beautifully. And to our moderator, Nina Hunteman, Suffolk University Associate Professor in the Department of Communication and Journalism, where she teaches and conducts research about the social impact of media. Thanks, Nina. Thank you, Wendy. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, I just want to thank again SCAT TV for putting this event together and all of the um, uh, partners, as well as Wendy and Erica. So before I introduce the panel, I'm going to provide a very brief context for what has brought us all here this evening. I promise it will be short because I, too, want to hear from our panelists. But as a short context, it will probably have many holes and blank spaces, but hopefully that will be filled in through our discussion. The term net neutrality or network neutrality first appeared in a paper written by Columbia University law professor Tim Wu in 2003. In that paper titled Network Neutrality, Broadband Discrimination, Wu defined network neutrality as, quote, a network design principle. The idea is that a maximally useful public information aspires to treat all content, sites, and platforms equally. He outlined in this paper how network neutrality could be established through regulation without stifling competition. Wu revealed how service providers in 2003 had already, and would likely in the future, discriminate if net neutrality was not secured through regulation. Opponents to regulation of net neutrality argue that data discrimination is not a problem because blocking content or degrading the speed of our networks is not in the best interest of the service provider. If internet service providers deliver bad service, customers would be encouraged to seek better service through a competing provider. Since Wu's paper, the idea of net neutrality, also known as open internet, has developed into many different and nuanced versions of what it means to operate a network that does not discriminate the internet traffic that flows across it. Should net neutrality pro protect quality of service so that higher fees cannot be charged for higher quality service, a tiered model? Or should net neutrality allow for tiered service, but not allow for exclusivity contracts, meaning anyone who can pay for higher quality service should be granted that service? Admits, admits this debate, in 2010, the Federal Communications Commission issued an open internet order to try to establish a network neutrality policy. This order was based on three principles. Number one, transparency, meaning if broadband providers were using network management practices to control the performance of their services, they must disclose those practices to their customers. No blocking meaning broadband providers could not block lawful content, services, or applications. And three, no unreasonable discrimination, meaning broadband providers may not unreasonably discriminate in just transmitting lawful network traffic. 
This last principle did not apply to mobile broadband providers, however. Verizon Communication, one of the largest mobile and fixed broadband providers in the United States, challenged this order in court. And on January 14th of 2014, the United States Court of Appeals struck the no blocking and no unreasonable discrimination rules of the order, but did uphold the transparency rule. Since January, we have seen several developments among the largest content providers and largest internet service providers that suggest the principles of net neutrality outlined by Wu in 2003 may be in jeopardy. Last month, Netflix announced a mutually beneficial interconnection agreement that would provide high quality Netflix a high-quality Netflix video experience for Comcast subscribers. And just yesterday, I read in an article in the Wall Street Journal that Apple is talking to Comcast about building a streaming television service that would guarantee a high level of quality for Comcast subscribers to Apple's content. Business analysts predict that the cost of these agreements for Apple and Netflix will be passed along to customers in higher subscription fees. Watching these business deals between significant players in the digital content and distribution industry develop so quickly after the January court decision leaves many of us wondering, what will internet access look like for the rest of us, both for those among us who don't subscribe to Netflix or use Apple services and who are not, con who are not customers of these media companies, but also for those among us who are media makers how will we get our content to audiences if we can't afford the internet fast lane? The purpose of this evening is to understand how net neutrality is currently being defined, the likely direction that open internet policies may take moving forward, and the effect these developments will have on citizens. To accomplish this, we have a wonderful panel of experts that I'm now happy to introduce. <coughs> Candace Clement. Candace is the Advocacy and Organizing Manager for Free Press, a national organization that campaigns for media and technology policy reform. Issues central to free press include universal and affordable internet access, diverse media ownership, and public media. In 2010, Candace co-authored the Free Press report, New Public Media, a Plan for Action, which proposes a policy framework for funding local community news reporting. She also serves on the board of directors of Rock Girls Campaign Boston. Welcome, Candace. Thanks. David Lyons. David, Daniel, sorry, Daniel Lyons. Daniel is an assistant professor at Boston College Law School. He specializes in the area of property, telecommunications, and administrative law. Before joining the faculty of BC, Daniel practiced energy, telecommunications, and administrative law at the firm of Munger, Tolls, and Olson in Los Angeles. He also clerked for the Judge Cynthia Holcomb, Hall of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And in December, Daniel published the article, Restoring Limits on the FCC's Ancillary Authority in Free State Foundation's Perspective. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Kara Lisa Berg Powers. Kara is co-director of Press Pass TV, a Boston-based organization that works with young people to produce videos that address underrepresented social issues, social justice issues in their community. Before joining Press Pass, Kara founded the Youth Media Institute Project, Think Different, now called Amplify Me, and also ran digital media programming for the United Teen Equality Center. She holds a doctorate in educational leadership and change from Fielding Graduate University. And finally, Dave Talbot. Dave is an editor and chief correspondent at MIT Technology Review, the longest running technology magazine established in 1899. Dave is an award-winning journalist who writes about internet te uh, information technology, energy, communications, and security. In 2008, his feature about the Obama campaign's social networking operation was selected for the Best Technology Writing 2009 Award. David is a former Night Science um, journal Journalism Fellow, and he was an investigative reporter at the Boston Herald. To get us started, I have a question I'd like to address to um, Candace first. In my opening, I discussed Netflix and, uh, and Comcast and Apple, um, but it does leave me kind of wondering, the whole debate over net neutrality and whether or not viewers can watch House of Cards in high definition uh, does sound like the woes of a, of a privileged class, um, but what implications, do, implications does the potential loss of an open internet have for all citizens? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and thank you for starting there, because I think a lot of this debate has been framed around the Netflix issue or Apple, you know, now it's moving into this Apple TV discussion. Um, but net neutrality is really so much bigger than that. So, you know, when we're talking about net neutrality, it, it's, it's been a tricky thing to define through the years, you know. <laughs> but I think what we're really saying is, um, when you go online, the companies that you write a check to every month to get access to the internet, so be that Comcast, AT&T, Time Warner, whoever, um, they should not be making decisions about which websites load faster, which websites load slower. They shouldn't have the ability to block websites <coughs> just because they want to or because it might pose some sort of competitive threat. Um, net neutrality really keeps you as the internet user in the driver's seat. And um, the conversation around Netflix in particular, it, you know, it's an interesting one, but um, Think about the fact that Netflix didn't exist, you know, just a couple years ago. And what the internet has been so great for is so much, you know, entrepreneurial innovation, economic innovation. It has connected us to uh, friends and family in a way never seen before. Can you think of a thing that you do anymore that doesn't have some connection to the internet? It's just become so much a part of our lives. Um, so net neutrality, it's, it's really about so much more than that. It's about the internet as we know it, the internet that we have grown to know and love. Um, so when we're talking about Netflix, I always like to think, well, what about the next Netflix? You know, what about the company that was going to come along next? And, and how would they be able to compete if the only way to get online and to get to their users is to enter into some sort of you know, agreement where they have to pay more money to reach people? That's, that's not the internet as we know it today. Thank you. Daniel, so I like to believe that the FCC, when they were creating the open internet order, were thinking about the, net net, the next Netflix and also citizens just uh, wanting to access the internet. Um, but you described their attempt to regulate internet activity as freelancing at the edge of its statutory authority. I wonder if you could explain for us um, how is the FCC's authority defined and why in this case did the U.S. Court of Appeals think they overstepped that authority? Sure. So to understand what was going on in the court's decision, you have to step back and look at what is the law that gives the FCC the power to do what it does, right? The FCC draws its power from the Communications Act, which was a law that was written in 1934. The Communications Act tells the FCC it can regulate three things directly. Telecommunication service, which generally means our telephone lines. Uh, broad, uh, broadcast television, so CBS, NBC, ABC, things like that, and cable television service. And the problem that the FCC has is that the internet doesn't really fit into any of those three categories. So it's not clear to the FCC what authority, if any, they had over, these, uh, over uh, the internet uh, broadband lines that we now use to communicate, right? Now, the FCC has one other uh, strand of authority that it can use. It's called its ancillary authority which basically tells the FCC they can regulate other things to the extent that those things are related to broadcasting, telephone service, or cable service. But they don't have direct authority to regulate the internet. So when the FCC came out with their open internet rules in 2010, they were attempting to use this ancillary authority. But in order to do so, they had to make the argument that uh, in order to reach broadband, reaching broadband and adopting net neutrality rules was necessary in order to get to one of these other core areas of the FCC's expertise. Um, and they ran afoul of a particular nuance of the Communications Act uh, that said that if you're not treating, uh, if you don't classify a network as a common carrier, then you can't put common carriage duties on it. So to back up a second, what's common carriage, right? Common carriage means um, a duty to serve all comers at just and reasonable rates. It, it's uh, uh, legal duty that we put upon certain infrastructure companies like the post office or railroads, um, certain industries and travel industry that says that a company cannot pick and choose who they're going to serve. The uh, telephone companies were treated as common carriers, but the FCC made the decision in the early 2000s that internet is not like the telephone company and therefore they don't count as common carriers. Because of that, when they later came along in 2010 and tried to put net neutrality rules upon broadband providers, the, the court backed up and said, well, wait a minute. You told us they're not common carriers, so you can't put common carriage obligations on them. And these net neutrality restrictions, the requirements that say you have to provide access to all websites um, and you can't charge for access for, uh, 
uh, website in order to be able to reach your customer. It looks a lot like common carriage. And since it looked like common carriage, it ran afoul of the restriction that said you can't put common carriage on something that's not a common carriage network. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? <laughs> We're going to parse it out even further. Uh, so Dave, you've written a lot about the net neutrality debate and technology review. Can you just give us a, a sense, perhaps broadly, and we'll, and we'll dive in a little deeper, on what are some of the issues, um, some, some of the fears of losing net neutrality from uh, consumers and, and perhaps competitors to these big companies? Sure. I think it's important to start with some really big context. and. One piece of big context is that the United States, uh, by one ranking, is um, 16th in the world in, uh, in internet speed, availability, and price, uh, directly behind Portugal. Um, so the, the situation in this country where the internet was invented is pretty bad. And what we see happening is a slow improvement in average speeds and so forth around the country. But we also see with the removal of uh, net neutrality proposed regulations, we start to see that the, the big companies are trying to figure out ways to charge people more for sort of the same infrastructure that they already have. Um, and some of, the, some of the ways, just in the, in the wake of the ruling, we saw things like AT&T trying to get, uh, offering things like sponsored data, where ESPN can pay your data charges, so you get ESPN for free on your phone. Um, and you know, you'd still pay for other kinds of data. So you see the favoring of certain types of content over another. And there's a number of examples like that um, that, that are coming out. So these are some of the issues that we're seeing in this country. Uh, what we have, the, the, in general, the landscape is, is not as competitive as it might be. And where, where you see that there is competition to provide internet service, you suddenly see speeds go up and prices come down. So I think even more important than the net neutrality, which is, you know, which, you know, might, might some things be favored over others, we have a larger issue of, of just internet access and price in this country and a very varied level of service. So I think it's important that we get that context out there too and what we're going to do about that. Are the big companies going to do better? Is there a role for public agencies like cities to go ahead and build networks where that's happened? Uh, we've seen competition come in and prices come down or like Google Fiber coming in Kansas City, suddenly uh, they're, they're offering 100 times the speed, or sorry, about 10 times the speed, and they're, they're able to do it for the same price as Time Warner Cable was doing. Gee, suddenly speeds start going up uh, with the incumbents. Why is that? It's because competition came in. So one big question going forward is how are we going to get this competition? How are we going to get more people served with the high speeds and the affordable prices that will allow this issue to even, you know, to become more relevant? Um, because more people are simply going to have the, the service in the first place. So that would be good to hit on at some point tonight. I don't know if, it, if you want to, then you better re-ask your question <coughs> because I don't think I quite answered it about well, these. Actually, um, no, but you brought up something else that I think to your point is really important to consider. So if, um, if there was competition for internet service, like right now I think most of us, we have one or two options when we're trying to decide how we want to get internet to our house. Right. And even less so if we're trying to get a particular kind of television cable package. Right. Um, do you see potentially that if there was competition that the principles of net neutrality might actually be a selling point? Like, hey, go with us and, and we won't you know, block content. You'll be able to go wherever you want because we adhere certainly. to these principles? I mean, certainly. You'd, you'd have the ability, you know, uh, as, as Daniel was saying before, uh, I think you were saying it before, um, but that, that, that it becomes, I think the argument of the industry has been that, well, we'll be neutral because if we're not, they'll be, you know, the other guy will, will do a better job than us. So that's why we can't, you know, we, we can't throttle things because the, the, our competitor will do a better job and then they'll go to the competitor. But you have to have the competitor in order for that effect to, to happen. And they, they love that argument too. I think um, there was a, a filing window that just closed, I think, on Friday for over this issue at the FCC and, and one of the ISPs brought that up. Well, of course we'll adhere to net neutrality because if we didn't you could just go to a competitor. I don't know about you guys but I don't have I have one company I can choose from if I want high speed internet in my town that that's it. And and to that point, you know, there's more more, more mergers coming, right? Yeah, there's mergers are the are the hot thing these days. Um, there's a proposed merger between um, Comcast and Time Warner Cable. So Comcast is currently the the largest cable and internet company in the country, and they want to buy up the second largest. So you know, talk about uh, a gatekeeper that has a lot of power. Um, this is just a, an opportunity for them to grow even bigger. 
Well, it's an interesting fact with regard to the, the Comcast Time Warner merger because Comcast is the one entity in the industry that is bound by net neutrality rules. It's true. Right. So the FCC can't enforce net neutrality rules on um, because of their the cable industry generally. Service? No, but because um, it was a condition that Comcast agreed to voluntarily yes. as a condition of acquire, getting permission to acquire NBC Universal. So Comcast is bound by net neutrality rules at least through 2018, I believe. Right, yeah. And so one of their selling points in, when acquiring Time Warner is to say, look, now all the folks that are Time Warner customers are going to be protected by net neutrality too. Until, Until 2018. 2018. Right. <laughs> and so one thing, I, one thing I've, I expect the FCC to do as a condition of uh, proving this merger, if they do, is to push that date out a little bit further. Yeah, yeah. Kara, I want to ask you, because, you know, we're talking about these large companies and, and, again, still talking about sort of Netflix subscribers, you know, but the constituent that you work with, you mm -hmm. know, youth in their communities, like, they're creating media, they're making media, they yep. would like this, I assume, to be seen by others, you know, that's part of the, uh, the, the promise, you make it and then you show it. It wasn't too long ago, but that just wasn't even feasible. You know, when I was a kid, we got camcorders and that became this revolutionary thing where you could cheaply record video, but I could show it to my friends. I couldn't put it on YouTube because YouTube didn't exist. Right. And so their, their experience of, of media, digital content, is totally different. And so I'm wondering from the perspective of the, of the young people you work with, like how are these issues potentially going to affect how they experience the world, but then also how they contribute their own voice? Absolutely. And I think to go back a little bit, I think it's actually, you know, we, we hear a lot about millennials and they're this and they're that. And we, you know, we... Um, we hear how much their lives are different than ours and ultimately it's about tools because um, when I actually, so I've done a basically like three versions of the same dissertation. Once as when I was in college, once as my master's, and then once as my doctorate and it, they're vastly different because of the speed of change of technology. Um, so when I wrote my, um, my senior thesis in college 10 years ago, there, I mean, YouTube literally was just coming onto the scene. There was a completely different um, world. But a lot of the things that I looked at were the history of youth as content creators, which is the entire movement of hip hop, which is pirate radio stations. There is tons of actually like pop culture films that were mainstream in the 80s are about youth creating content in these ways. Um, and so there, <coughs> ultimately, I would say, Young people will find a way. Um, the, the bigger concern, I think, is what they're, so I absolutely think it is important to our distribution channels. And I absolutely think that, um, that the issue of net neutrality, which right there, I feel like, is part of where we, where we get lost. Because the, that is such a phrase, that, that phrase in and of itself shows you the level at which we're communicating about this and not to the people that it actually affects on a day-to-day -day level. Um, but in addition to that, and cable access and the changing of those, you know, those investments and contracts and all of that, and, and increasing consolidation, certainly the ability for young people to share their voice is an issue. But what I'm actually more concerned about is their access to actual information and discourse and um, being able to have really effective communication rights. And so... For me, I look back at, I think it was 2010, Candace can correct me if I'm wrong, when we were really startled by um, a letter making the rounds from a lot of groups that identified as civil rights groups, La Raza, some chapters of the NAACP, where essentially they were saying, well, you know, there's, there's a trade-off. You know, we're willing to step back a little bit on net neutrality, and maybe net neutrality is actually overstepping because it's going to discourage um, you know, companies from investing in our communities and they really need to roll out into our communities. And to me, that's we've seen that argument made in any number of industries. And the fact is that the, the product isn't worth it. If we can't actually have broadband access in our communities where young people are able to really diligently research and get information that is robust and be able to communicate in platforms we haven't even imagined yet, then that internet isn't worth coming to our communities. So I think that it's easy for us to think about, well, what are the ways that these are going to impact the young people? The fact is we just don't know because none of us had thought about the ways that we use the Internet now. When we talked about a few years ago what these kind of models of the collapse of net neutrality could look like, they're not even th the things that have happened since January are things we didn't even think about. They're not cable pricing models. They're, they're far more innovative and sometimes insidious than that. So I think that we should be ringing alarm bells really loudly and we need to find better ways to talk about it. So I, 
I'm hearing a, a common thread between a lot, what a, several of you have said. Um, you know, and Dave brought this up in his first response. Where is the place for public internet access? You know, for and by that I mean we used to talk about municipal Wi-Fi, and then also that disappeared. Anybody on the panel, like, where are we at with that? Is that viable? Are there places where that's thriving? Has that been killed by lobbying? Well, the, the actually the in um, was it New American Media did a study I believe last year where actually and they ranked things based on um, availability, based on price, based on speed, and the three highest ranking places in the U.S., which were still very far down the list internationally, as you were saying, um, were all municipal wireless, um, and I think wow. uh, it was Lafayette, Louisiana, D.C., and Bristol, Virginia. So. It's certainly viable. The flip side, though, is that there's a lot of municipal Wi-Fi projects that have gone belly up, right? Portland, Oregon is a really big example of a company. The city has invested um, thousands, if not millions, of dollars in a system that simply doesn't work. Um, Google Fiber is moving into Provo because they're taking over a municipal Wi-Fi program that Provo no longer wants to foot the bill to run. So it works in some places, and it doesn't work in others. Um, I think it's uh, a laudatory incentive for taxpayers that they want to go in and fill the void in an area that doesn't have enough broadband, right? Some is better than none. Um, but it's not, I think, a panacea that solves mm -hmm. the problem everywhere. Well, They'll work think, in some places and not in others. Well, and I think part of that is also us identifying we as a nation have lots of other places where we certainly could think of things as a municipal service that we don't, right? We, there are places that don't have fire or police. Um, so I think it really is a matter that it, that comes down to a level of public investment. And there's just one little amplification on that is that um, the reason some of them might not do well could be, have less to do with the inherent economics than how well that particular city executed on a given plan. Um, so that needs to be studied and, and teased out to know which which is the reason why. Yes, the fact that this didn't work doesn't mean that none yeah. would work. Right. That's very and, true. And, and to your question, there are cases. There was one a city in Minnesota where, um, and I'm forgetting the name of the city, where the city itself came in and, and put in, um, I believe it was fiber, and the local ISP suddenly overnight was able to double its speed offerings for the same price. So clearly, when the Muni came in and did it, things got better for the consumer. So. Yeah, no question. Competition yeah. is better than, yeah. than the obverse. And, um, but it wasn't an area. It wasn't an area that had no service. It was an area that did have service. Um, so it, it can work even in, even where there's already some service. Sure. Yeah. You know, Dave, you brought up um, earlier uh, the way that internet access exists in, in other countries, and you know, the U.S. being pretty far down the list or farther than we would expect. Um, and Kara mentioned that there are models. Um, of what will happen post net neutrality we haven't even dreamed up but in some places there are already models developing because there is no net neutrality could right. you talk to us about how it works in other countries where this sure. concept of open internet net neutrality was never even on the ground well i um i've made a couple of trips to africa and there's it, it, the, the situation is entirely different as you would imagine because uh, in many areas people have no uh, internet access no data plan whatsoever um, so this, this is a very abstract, abstruse discussion we're having to people who don't have any data. Um, so what you've seen happen in, in a number of countries, and I'm, I think Philippines is one, is you've had Facebook uh, convince the mobile operator, hey, give these people, uh, give your customers a free text-only Facebook data plan, and that will sort of prime the pump. Um, and then as the customer starts to see things and see links that, that he wants to click, suddenly they're buying data. Um, and it's a way to get people on the internet who never knew what it was or why they would care. And as you would imagine, there's two sides to this coin. You know, Facebook will say, well, we're, we're introducing people to this great uh, thing, the internet. Uh, on the other hand, it means that the, inter the experience of the internet for those newcomers is entirely mediated uh, by Facebook, uh, which you, you could kind of come down on the side and say that's not exactly net neutrality. That's a that's a gatekeeper, uh, wall garden almost, way for somebody to experience um, the internet. Uh, but that's, that's what Facebook has done in, in a few countries and is trying to do it in more. Uh, Google has something um, similar. Um, it's, it's Google Free Zone and Facebook Zero. So entirely different context than everything we've talked about um, until now. 
could the panelists discuss, um, and perhaps uh, Daniel, I can start with you, the importance of transparency. Why did the U.S. Appeals Court decide to uphold transparency, and why is that something that uh, is, is a good thing in neutrality? Well, the transparency rule simply said, uh, required the broadband providers to disclose whatever it is they're doing, right? Whatever your rules are for how you transport data across the internet, what, what are you blocking, what are you not, or what speed you're going, things like that. You have to be open with the customers and tell them what you're, do, what you're providing. And that's, a, I think, a basic consumer protection obligation. Um, I'm not convinced there's anybody in the industry that thought that was a real problem, right? Um, if you're a customer, and especially if you're uh, one of these broadband companies that's relying on competition, right, uh, as your rationale for why you don't need net neutrality, then one of the selling points for the customer is that they need to be able to choose, be, uh, to choose among providers, and so they need to know what each provider is offering. The transparency rules make sure that each of the companies discloses clearly to consumers what it is that they're providing, uh, and so the consumers understand what they're getting and can pick and choose one against the other. And I think it's an essential prerequisite to a fair market. And again, choose if they have competition in the market to be able to choose. Right. right. I know that uh, Netflix has this neat little you know, real-time meter where you can see how fast data, their data is streaming to you by clicking on your service provider. And I looked at it a couple days ago, and you see this like precipitous down increase with Comcast. And then all of a sudden in January, February, between January and February, where they probably made that deal, the connectivity goes, goes back up again. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, but the, the, the graphic that Netflix puts forth is a little bit uh, deceptive. And what I mean by that is there's an awful lot going on in the internet ecosystem that's packed into that one little graphic, right? So um, part of the problem that uh, Netflix was having with uh, delivering data to Comcast was not an issue with Comcast, but an issue with the middleman. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, um, one of the things that doesn't often come out in these types of discussions is the fact that um, Netflix doesn't serve up its data for free, right? Netflix pays somebody in order to carry their content to the internet. Historically, they've used these companies that are called transit providers, uh, companies that um, basically operate uh, networks within the deep bowels of the internet, right? <laughs> um, Netflix pays Level 3 or Cogent or one of these other um, transit providers some amount of money, and then it's up to the transit provider to make sure that the Netflix's data that they send to the provider then goes on to the end user at Comcast or Verizon or wherever. Um, one, con uh, Netflix was having trouble with one of these transit providers in particular, a company named Cogent. Um, Cogent, um, so, so you think of the internet as not just a network, but a network of networks, right? And so part of the problem sometimes are bottlenecks be where these two networks meet up. One of the problems that Cogent was having was that the lines between Cogent's network and Comcast's network were getting full. Uh, when they signed up Netflix as a customer, um, it dramatically increased the amount of data that Cogent was pushing through to Comcast and Verizon and other companies, right? Netflix is, I think, currently responsible for something like one-third of all internet traffic during peak time in the United States. So if you're responsible for carrying Netflix traffic, that's a lot of data. So when Cogent realized they needed to upgrade the connections that get data from Cogent to Comcast, um, they asked Comcast to pay some money, and Comcast said, well, if it's your customers that's causing the need for more data, you should pay for the upgraded pipe, making the pipes fatter. Uh, and Cogent didn't pay, and, part of the, and so that was one of the reasons why data from Netflix to Comcast was slowing down. My sense is that Netflix got tired of being trapped by this dispute between Cogent and um, Comcast, and so they cut out the middleman. So what we see in this deal between Netflix and Comcast is now there's a direct line from Netflix to Comcast, right? So the data is flowing directly from Netflix to Comcast and not going through this middleman cogent and not getting stuck in that cogent bottleneck. Now, would that kind of relationship violate this idea of non-exclusivity contracts, a sort of core principle of something that the original paper by Tim Wu, he laid out that you, know, you should not have these exclusivity contracts that might treat some providers uh, better than others, content providers better than others. Does that fall within that concept, that principle? Um, it doesn't. Um, it, it sort of gets at the edges of it and it raises similar concerns, concerns similar to what Professor Wu was getting at in his paper. Um, but the agreement between Comcast and Netflix is further into the, up into the internet ecosystem than what the net neutrality rules were worried about. So the net neutrality rules were worried about on the broadband network that provides service to my home, right, is uh, Netflix going to get some priority over Amazon or Hulu or some other competing service. And although Netflix and Comcast have not made much of their deal public, 
The one thing they have uh, disclosed to everybody who is listening is that uh, Netflix is not being treated any differently than anybody else in the broadband part of the network. So does the FCKC have any authority over the bowels of the internet that you just described? Because it starts to get, for those of us who are just on the other end waiting for our content, mm -hmm. uh, really confusing as to understand, you know, why am I having slow traffic and didn't I pay for better service and so forth? I mean, is there any authority the FCC can exert on these kinds of relationships? There is, although the contours of that are not clear, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody's been pitching this uh, net neutrality loss in the D.C. circuit as a big loss for the FCC, but it wasn't. In fact, I think if you go back and talk to the people at Verizon and say, you know, this is, if you knew now what you knew then, would you have brought this case? I think they probably would say <coughs> no. And the reason is because although the court said you can't impose these particular rules on broadband providers, the net neutrality rules as the court wrote them, um, the court bought the FCC's argument that they have some authority to regulate broadband providers and even further into the Internet ecosystem, potentially companies like Google as well. Um, as long as what, whatever they do doesn't constitute common carriage. And so what's the limit on that? We're not entirely sure yet. Um, but it's um, a potentially silver lining for the FCC that could, that could lead to um, a substantial amount of regulatory involvement going forward. Yeah, I think that the interesting thing when you were talking about what happened with the court case, I think people get a little bit confused about the details of it. The court didn't decide that net neutrality was good or bad. That wasn't what the decision about. It wasn't about the merits of net neutrality. It was about whether or not the FCC had the authority to write rules about net neutrality or not, and the court said that they didn't. And I think the reason for that is just a series of bad decisions over the last decade that <coughs> took the FCC's definition of what broadband internet is further and further away from that common carriage idea, right? It took it further away from that communications or telecommunications service. So, you know, free press and, and millions of people and organizations have been advocating for a very simple and we think elegant solution to the problem, um, which is for the FCC to just reclassify what broadband is under a different part of the law. Um, if the FCC takes the steps to reclassify broadband as a communication service under Title II of the Communications Act, um, that will give them the authority to regulate uh, these entities as common carriers and, and it will sort of resolve this whole problem. Um, so again, it, it's not about, the case was never about whether or not net neutrality was good or bad. It was always about whether or not the FCC had the authority. And I think the, the path forward for them could, could be very clear. The problem is getting them to have the political will to actually take that action and, and do something. Yeah, I mean, that's what I wanted to bring up, is that we, perhaps in this conversation, we forget that the FCC is a political animal, right? I mean, it's appointed by members of the president and so forth, and so there is, there's a, a pull there, and usually they try and balance, you know, Democrat, Republican, and so forth, but there's a lot of other interests that are being represented on the FCC. You know, what's the likelihood of this reclassification? Well, um, I think that there is a lot of momentum for this idea outside of Washington. And what we have to reckon with now is the inside of Washington mentality that it's impossible. We couldn't do it. They can. You know, uh, something that I think might be a little more impossible might be getting a bill passed in Congress, considering how, you know, good Congress has gotten lately about passing legislation. Um, that would be more, a cha more of a challenging feat. The FCC can do this by themselves. They don't actually need any new laws to be passed. They, they just have to have the political will to do it. And so I think that really does require pressure from the outside. It requires pressure from people like us in the room. It requires pressure from, you know, big companies. Like we've been running a campaign right now to try and get the CEOs of, you know, these major edge companies to come out and in support of net neutrality like Facebook and Google and, you know, Netflix. These are all companies that are going to be harmed by the loss of net neutrality. So we think that they have a stake in this fight. Um, in fact, I'd venture to say that the only people who gain to benefit from the loss of net neutrality are those internet service providers themselves. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be a battle, but I, I don't think it's impossible. Um, you know, there's five FCC commissioners. Where's Facebook on this now, if I may just ask? That. Yeah, where's Facebook fall on this? I, I do not know. Uh, Dave, what, what are the stakeholders in Massachusetts from your perspective? Like, we're, we're sort of known as a state full of, you know, entrepreneurs in the tech industry. Have they been speaking about this? Is there some clear lines falling? You know, maybe not the Facebooks, but the, the local... The local homegrown uh, entrepreneurs, what, where are they falling on this? 
Well, I think in the major centers where you have start the startup industries and the, the universities, you already have extremely high-speed internet. So they may not be feeling it um, very powerfully, but the communities around them certainly are. And I, I think everybody understands that it's the, the whole community has to have the, the service for, for the economy to, to flourish. And how to, how to provision broadband or high-speed internet is what the term we should be using is, um, is, is a major question for the state as a whole. And until very recently, the whole western part of Massachusetts, as you know, um, a lot of towns had, still had dial-up. And, and so the state has just invested in a 1,200-mile uh, fiber backbone to um, bring, enable internet companies to start getting better service out to the towns. I think throughout the state, we have the ability of municipalities, if they so choose, to get into the business of, of, of uh, installing fiber loops and competing with the incumbents and or filling gaps where there, there aren't any. There are some municipalities that do that now. Uh, some of them do it well. Some of them are kind of just getting started. Um, one small example, Taunton is a small city south of here that probably few of us have gone to, but um, you can get for $29 from your town, uh, 20 megabit uh, symmetrical service uh, from, your, from the city itself. So these kinds of examples are cropping up and, and there could be more of them in the future. Yeah, and I'll, I'll make a point as a, as a resident of Western Mass, you know, I see this lack of internet um, uh, all the time. And it's really interesting because my husband and I are actually in the phase of our lives where we're like, let's buy a home, let's do it. There's so many towns that we just have to rule out completely because we can't, we can't live in a town that doesn't have internet access. And this program is great, you know, the um, Massachusetts Broadband MBA. Initiative, yeah. yeah, Massachusetts Broadband Initiative it is, has plans to do great things, and it just it, it hasn't happened yet. So the, the impact that it has, you know, we're, we're talking about a, an issue like net neutrality or internet access, you know, it seems like it might be something that's just about, like, getting, you know, cute cat videos and looking at Facebook. But it actually impacts, you know, decisions that people make about their lives, the the economy of local communities. And for the and for the for the, for a town to hear a, a potential buyer like you, um, and they're realizing, well, gee, I don't have any any service here, and this person isn't going to buy in my community. But then you have a small town like Leverett, which did just put in a fiber backbone, right. um, and that's I'm sure a place that you would look at. Incentivizing, yeah. So, mm -hmm. well, one of the things that concerns me about that that it has to do with sort of the uh, the strength of the tax base and who lives there and what towns can afford to do right. this. Certainly, and I think that if we're to go back to the idea of like, well, as an entrepreneur, is or it part of where we have failed and part of where we need to be stronger to influence those five people to have political will, because political will, as we know, comes from pressure, yes. um, is translating this better to people about how it impacts their lives. Essentially, it is about those decisions, but it, and, and so for me as a, as a media educator and somebody who works with young people to produce media and has done so with very, um, with young people who are dealing with really dire circumstances in their lives, I've spent a lot of time going back and forth um, over the years about how important my role is. Right? I've worked in centers where there are gang intervention specialists who literally roll out the door to intervene in shootings. And in those moments, producing a TV show with young people doesn't seem that important. However, it is that TV show that keeps kids out of that situation in the first place. It is also pre producing PSAs and short videos and short documentaries that we do at Press Pass TV that not only keeps kids out of trouble, which is a phrase we hear a lot, but gives them an opportunity to have a say in who they are. When young people, all, all of my research has revolved around young people using a media as a tool for social change and self-actualization, but also about what it means when every other image that they see of themselves is the kind of images that we see in mainstream media. And for the, in that way, the, the cute cat videos and all that, and I was thinking of internet as a first world problem, um, which is the whole conversation I don't have time for, um, is really trivializing something that is a critical pipeline for young people out of poverty and trauma. And I think that it is really important for us to talk in those terms to people who have the training and the advocacy you know, legs to actually be part of this movement, but maybe think of it as something that's trivial. Because the fact is you can't speak truth to power if your vocal cords have been slashed. And essentially, that is, that is what we're talking about here.
Can you just uh, elaborate a little bit? What what is very fundamentally different about the representations that, that the young people you work with make about themselves versus mm -hmm. what they see in the mainstream media? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, well, in the in the news media, for example, primarily young people of color are victims or perpetrators of crime um, because we have uh, a, I think, very flawed cultural consensus about what news is for. Um, the young people see themselves in their communities in this way, and it compounds real challenges that they're facing and creates a, a internalized image of hopelessness and helplessness um, that can be very hard to overcome if you don't have other things to combat it. At the same time, you have TV networks that are scrambling to figure out how to deal with the fact that we all in the home buying, baby having, you know, used to be the, the like prime contingent, watch TV online and um, on our DVRs and in our time and how to actually, how to, how to measure that, that they are, you know, creating this very homogenized product that often does not look like our generation and does not um, speak to our values and gets canceled very quickly. <laughs> and so there, there are not a lot of images in primetime you know, dramas and comedies that actually look or sound like the youth of color that I work with, um, unless they are side characters or are violent stereotypes. And so those kind of images and not having a say about the education that they have, high stakes standardized testing, all of those issues that really do impact their day-to-day -day lives, when people who are making those decisions, not only does that impact their self-perception, but when people who are making those decisions only have those images in mind, they make very different decisions than if they had the content that youth were producing about themselves, or if young people and their communities had more of an influence, and this was all measured differently, um, they would be making very different decisions if they had those images in mind. And so when they do have the opportunity to produce those images, they look very different than what we would see when we turn on television. Absolutely. If nothing else, that they identify, I think, what a lot of us are looking for in content. They have context. They have nuance. They have humanity. They talk about solutions. I mean, I, you know, we're, we're, we have a little bit of an audience here. I bet if I asked for people to raise their hands, who watches the evening news? Not a lot would go up. And if I then asked you how you feel when you watch the evening news, it would be not very good. And the fact is that most of the content that our young people create, even if it is dealing with some of the very difficult issues that are, that are in their communities, whether it is incredibly high asthma rates in Roxbury because of diesel pollution or um, violence that is concentrated in communities around our state that have had less investment in transportation and other things, that they're pointed at solutions. And they're talking about the real effects on people's lives. And those, that kind of media can be part of our ecosystem if we have a free and open internet. Yeah, I, I feel the thing that um, has always motivated me about media in general um, is uh, the potential that it has and the power that it has for everybody to be able to provide that narrative or have that opportunity to tell their own stories. Um, if you look back at the history of communications media, you see it every time there's a new invention. This is it. This is the, this is the medium of the people, the printing press. It's going to change everything, and it did for a while, right? And then what you see with all of these, radio, television, cable, it just becomes this corporatized thing that a few powerful companies control. And with the internet, we've been able to sort of stave that off for a really long time, right? You know, the, I'm not saying that there's not a role for powerful companies in the internet, but you know, Press Pass TV has their stuff online and, and I can get that just as fast as I can get content from Netflix. That's great, that's an amazing and powerful thing. Um, where we're at, this intersection, this moment, is, is the moment where we could lose the internet as we know it. This, if, if we continue to go down this road, I don't think that the internet without net neutrality or without common carriage, whatever, you know, whatever we want to call it, the internet without that is no longer the internet. I don't know what it is. It's like cable TV maybe, but it's, it's just not the internet anymore. And I, I haven't had a chance to read the David Byrne piece about what happens after the internet, but that was the, 
that was the hot topic of conversation today. Skynet. Really? <laughs> so, you know, we spent some time today just sort of peeling back uh, the onion skin of net neutrality, and it brings up so many different issues. I mean, just from like basic access, just like, do we have the infrastructure across the country that's equal? And can we even raise ourselves, you know, to the level that we would expect internationally in terms of access? Issues of politics of representation and what kind of authority our agencies have and so forth. It is, in some ways, an overwhelming topic. Um, but not to leave our audience feeling overwhelmed, I'd like to invite each one of you to talk about, you know, one thing that perhaps folks can do or one thing they should be concerned about or one way in which they can uh, to, to voice, you know, their their perspective on this that could perhaps make an impact or at least make us all feel a little less overwhelmed. <laughs> Can't just I feel like you? you're looking at me. <laughs> I'm going to start with you, but I'm going to point my finger at everybody. Yes, well, we have a plan. Um, no, we we really do strongly feel that this path of reclassification is the way to go. It's it's pretty tough to get legislation passed in Congress right now, and we don't need it. Um, the court said very clearly, you know, we're throwing out these rules because you don't treat. Um, internet service providers as common carriers, you, you have the ability to change that if you want to. So we're focusing all of our effort right now on pressuring the FCC. Um, we're also talking to members of Congress about this too um, and, and trying to get them involved in, in having those conversations with the FCC as well. Um, this is all stuff that if you guys are interested in learning about more, you can go to freepress.net um, or savetheinternet.com. Um, and uh, we do meetings with members of Congress. We organize all kinds of events and and send petitions and flood the FCC switchboard with phone calls. They love us. Um, so yeah, check it out. Thank you. Dave? Um, I guess the two quick things would be, why should you care? Um, taken to the logical extreme, you could get to the point where a few large content providers are either getting their bits prioritized or they are subsidizing the delivery of those bits to your uh, phone or your, your, your home computer. Um, and then everything else you have to pay for. So yes, it's still all there for you, but over time more people are going to uh, basically get the stuff that's for free or subsidized. And it, as, as you were saying, it, it's not the internet anymore, it's, it's something different. We're already seeing some movements in that direction. What can you do? Uh, start in your own town or city and just get involved with your, your city hall or your town hall and ask them, uh, especially if you're in Massachusetts, you know, do you have a, a light plant, a municipal light plant in your community? If so, does it have fiber? If it does, you know, what are they doing with it? Uh, if they don't, could they form such an organization or, or study how to do it in their own community? Depending on the circumstances of a given municipality, it's possible. Um, I happen to be also a commissioner on my uh, light <laughs> plant in Reading. That's why I'm, I talk about this is because I know enough to be dangerous. Um, well, you just don't talk about it. You're walking it. So all right. Well, I mean, it's, you, you can at least ask in your own community, is it possible for our community to get, actually get into this business, get a study group formed in, in your own community, just to start that, that conversation? Daniel? So I guess I'll be a little bit of the contrarian. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, there are a number of important issues that we brought about here. Net neutrality doesn't touch on all of them, and it's not the panacea for everything. And so I would encourage folks to think not just about um, what the internet is, but what it could be, right? So um, there's an argument out there that net neutrality rules, they promote innovation in content and applications online. They discourage innovation among the broadband providers, right? So um, in 2009, 2010, Metro PCS offered uh, what they were hoping was a cut rate uh, phone for the people, right? It would be unlimited talk, text, and YouTube because they um, convinced YouTube to compress their signals in a way that made it possible to get access over Metro PCS's 2G network. Um, and they were sort of excited because this was not the all full bells and whistles that Verizon and AT&T offered, right? Unlimited all internet access all the time. But it wasn't just the you know, flip phone with texting either. It was somewhere in between for people who wanted some internet access but not uh, willing to pay the, the big carrier rates. And that ended up going away because it violated net neutrality. The, the laws of the, the um, policy of net neutrality, although it's laudatory, has these unintended consequences at times that can discourage innovation within broadband markets. Um, things that don't all the, things that sometimes look bad in the short run can be good in the long run. Not that they always are, but for example, um, when AT and T signed its exclusive iPhone agreement, right? You couldn't get an iPhone unless you were at AT and T, and everyone thought, "Oh, that's horrible, right?" AT and T is this. Uh, evil competitor, and if I'm on Verizon, I don't get the iPhone, what's up with that? But what that prompted was Verizon to pour a ton of money into Android to work with Google and develop a competing platform. 
So now we have two competing standards, right? The iPhone platform and the Android platform. That wouldn't have happened if the iPhone was simply available to everybody by government mandate. So sometimes these sorts of viola these sorts of what we call net neutrality violations are anti-consumer. Sometimes they can be pro-consumer. And it's important, I think, to give the regulator the flexibility to d separate the wheat from the chaff. Thank you. Great. Kara? Um, I think that the most important thing you can do is have conversations with real people. And I think that it is really critical to break these issues down into more simple things and to talk about it as a human right. The communication, this, this isn't that, I'm sorry, but, but talk, text, and YouTube is not what the youth in my community need. They need to be able to create and to, and to share and they need to be able to do their homework on their phones or in some cases because they don't have they don't have computers at home and so and and i think that is important for them to be part of that conversation i think it's important for activists in our communities to be part of these conversations because they need to understand the way that you know verizon blocked an ARL text messaging and and the way that these issues really do relate to whatever issue they're working on, um, that it really is an issue of self-determination and an issue of, of human rights. Um, communication rights is one of the um, UN, I'm actually on my city's human rights commission. <laughs> and, um, and communication rights is, is part of the, the um, UN Declaration on Human Rights. So I think it really is important for us to understand that, um, that net neutrality may need to evolve with our understanding of the internet, but that first and foremost, we need to protect the uh, openness and, and find other ways to talk about it than net neutrality um, and make sure that people understand how important it is. Thank you. And to call their, their everybody. <laughs> call, call your everybody. <laughs> Thank you all so very much for talking with us tonight and trying to unpack some of these issues. All of the resources that were mentioned and many more will be available on uh, scatsomerville.org, so go there to um, find out more and read more. Thank you.